Hello and welcome to the Armin Show podcast. Science, people, creativity, subscribe if you haven't. YouTube, Spotify, every platform. The show continues to grow. Learning more is the goal. And also connecting with individuals who have understanding in a certain category. On this episode here, my guest, who is the author of this book, Inside the Orphan Drug Revolution, The Promise of Patient-Centered Biotechnology, I have James A. Garrity. James, welcome to the show. Thank you, Roman. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm happy to have you on. Your book is about orphan drugs. I find the drug category to be interesting. I once did biochemistry as a bachelor's degree, so it's a nice homage to that. Before we get into the book, how did you get into the category? Tell us about your background and your expertise in the field. Sure. Well, unlike you, I didn't study biochemistry. I'm not a scientist. And I, uh, I say in the book that I stumbled into the orphan drug revolution. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was to try to make this world, which you know is very science-driven, accessible to lay people. Uh, I started in, in 40 years ago working with a company that was trying to deal with the fact that the uh, products for hemophilia had been tainted by the, uh, by the presence of the HIV virus in the blood supply and was looking for ways to provide safer therapies. And I was on the forefront of the biotechnology revolution, developing genetically engineered safer versions of those products for hemophilia. And ultimately that work in hemophilia led to a company that was working on developing therapies for many other rare genetic diseases. This is wonderful. Now, before I would usually leave this for later, but are there any key people that got you into this field or this direction in the first place? Usually we have some guiding figures that set us on a path. Does anybody come to mind that you would include? There's one in particular for sure, and I talk about him at length in the book. His name was Henry Tremier. And at that company that I mentioned that was then called Baxter Travanol that was working on hemophilia therapies, he was the leader of that part of the company. And uh, he was my client when I was a consultant in the early years. He went on a few years later to become the president of Genzyme Corporation, a, a biotechnology company here in Boston where I'm based, which was then very small, very young. And uh, Henry had the idea that um, you actually could develop drugs for rare genetic diseases successfully, and you could build a company around those, which most people at the time thought was crazy, that the patient populations were too small and that's why the pharma companies ignored those diseases and those patients. But Henry had a, had a tremendous sense of mission and a tremendous sense of trying to help these patients and bring this science and this medicine to them. And that was very inspiring and uh, drew me and many other people into the cause. When I saw that in the book, I thought of, I, have, I have a friend that worked at Baxter Pharmaceuticals for a bit, and it reminded me of their work. They're not that far from where I am, yep. one of their hubs. Now... The topic you talk about in the book is not only drugs, but a specific category of drugs, orphan drugs, which treat orphan diseases. Can you tell us about the category and how that's separate from regular drugs? Exactly. So orphan diseases are basically, that's another term for simply rare diseases in common language. Uh, and they're generally you know, genetic diseases that strike a relatively small number of, of people, of patients. Uh, it's actually defined in the United States by a law called the Orphan Drug Act. And the passage of that law, which was signed into law in 1983, exactly, almost exactly 40 years ago, was one of the sparks, as I say in the book, that lit the orphan drug revolution. And the Orphan Drug Act in the United States defines an orphan disease as a disease which afflicts fewer than 200,000 people in the United States. In some ways, that can sound like a, you know, a lot, but when you look at the size of the United States population, that's approximately one half of 1% of the population, so a very small percentage of people. When you think of orphan drugs, what are some of the most obvious examples that come to mind and what they treat? So some orphan diseases are well known to people, often through celebrities and people who've made them famous by, by, by promoting the cause. Older listeners will remember uh, what was called the uh, Jerry Lewis telethons, Jerry's Kids in the 1950s and 60s, which raised money for muscular dystrophies, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and others. Uh, others, another disease that many people know of, of course, again, to older uh, listeners, was originally known for many years as Lou Gehrig's disease, named after a very famous New York Yankee baseball player who was stricken with it in the prime of his career 
that, as most people know today, is uh, is called ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, made famous more recently by the Ice Bucket Challenge, uh, also started by a young athlete who was stricken by ALS. Uh, those are two examples. Other examples, uh, cystic fibrosis has been is well known as the most pre prevalent genetic monogenic disease in Caucasian populations, uh, and uh, sickle cell anemia is the most prevalent genetic disease in in African populations. So those are those are well known in the, in the populations that suffer from them. As far as these drugs compared to the mass market drugs, what percentage of a, an average pharmaceutical company's efforts are on? the larger scale drugs and what percentage are on orphan drugs as far as effort or money? Well, that's, that's kind of the story of the book in some ways. And the story is that in, you know, in the early 1980s, when, when pa parents and patients advocated for the passage of the Orphan Drug Act, it was because no companies were spending any money or time trying to develop uh, drugs for rare genetic diseases. And so the Orphan Drug Act provided certain incentives, certain tax benefits, and very importantly, a period of market exclusivity if a company was successful in getting a drug developed and approved by the FDA, and, and there are similar kinds of provisions in Europe and other countries. And based on those, that's really what inspired Henry Tamir to focus Genzyme on developing diseases, uh, therapies for rare genetic diseases. And uh, a lot of people, again, felt that could never work, but it was very successful, very successful medically, and also ultimately successful financially in building a sustainable, valuable company. And the success of Genzyme's model inspired many other companies in biotechnology in particular using the tools of genetic engineering, but ultimately that spread into the pharma world. And today, I can't give you an exact percentage, but I can tell you that a very significant percentage of the research done in the biotechnology community and in some pharma companies is focused on rare genetic diseases today. I like that in the book, you take us through the companies and their actions. It creates a storyline because drug development is a step-by-step -step process. Okay, we got this one through. Oh, we didn't get approval. Next one, it's like a constant. It's almost like Bitcoin has its ups and blah, and then drug development had its own uh, ups and flows. This one didn't work. Okay, we need to go in this direction. Oh, we have to give up on this. This was too much of a cost. Constant adjustment in a way. Yeah, it's a very high-risk business, and certainly the overwhelming majority of drugs fail. If you look at drugs that start the early phases of research and development, the so-called preclinical phase, you know, more than 95% of all drugs that start preclinical testing fail. Even if you look at drugs that go through expensive clinical trials, you know, and even expensive late stage trials, more than half of those still fail. So failure rates are very high and very expensive. Right. Now here I have, interestingly enough, a listener supporter question from a biotech writer. It is a video question. Her name is Helen. She writes for a biotech website, and I'll just play that for you. From the perspective of getting a drug into a patient, what makes the process different for an orphan drug versus something that's used in a more common disease like leukemia? Yeah, the question was, what's different about getting a drug into clinical trials, it's tested in patients, right? And the two, mm -hmm. uh, that's a very good question. And many, you know, many things are similar. But uh, some things are different. Um, and I'll give you an example of something that's different and increasingly different in some ways today. You know, the question is, how do we, obviously, before we test a drug in patients, children or even adult patients, we want to know that it's safe and we want to have some reason to think that it works. And, you know, the, the only two ways to do that are either in kind of laboratory studies or in animal studies. And for common diseases, you know, animals can study, suffer from many of the same common diseases and so a lot of preclinical testing is done in animal models. For these rare genetic diseases, uh, there aren't so many, there aren't good animal models typically, but, but you can, we can take cells from patients, so-called patient-derived cells, and we can test, particularly when we're testing therapies that treat the root causes, the genetic causes of disease, we can test, as they say, in vitro, in the laboratory, uh, the drugs in the cells from the patients and actually looking at the biological reaction in the cells is often a better marker of whether a disease will work in clinical trials than testing it in an animal model would be. Oh, how often are tests done in vitro versus in animals? And is it way easier to do in vitro? It, it is easier and faster. Uh, and it's, I would say it's done increasingly because, 
you know, the wave of uh, biotechnology, you know, has led first to a, a whole variety of protein replacement therapies. But increasingly today, the, gen the therapies that are being tested are genetic therapies. And when you're looking at treating at that root cause of the disease, that is actually, you can observe that very well in a, in a cell, in looking at, you know, how the, how the different genes within the cell and the different biological components within the cell uh, react to the genetic, you know, intervention. And so increasingly, as genetic therapies are being developed, they're being tested increasingly in these patient-derived cells. Hmm. Interesting. Now, earlier you had mentioned the Orphan Drug Act. And that was a key element. If you can also describe that, as well as you mentioned that the AIDS epidemic was also a big uh, step in the process. Can you talk about these steps in the process yeah, those that were, have influenced orphan drugs? Those were two of the sparks that lit the revolution. And um, maybe talk about them separately. They're related, but they're also somewhat separate. I would say mm -hmm. the Orphan Drug Act, you know, I, I say in the book that the, the orphan drug revolution is a story of miracles and miracles that people have brought about through, you know, hard work and commitment. And the passage of the Orphan Drug Act was the first miracle, I think you could say, uh, because uh, it was it was started by a mother, Abby Myers, who the book starts with Abby's story and her family, uh, who had a child with a rare genetic disease and uh, for whom the company that was making a drug that worked for that disease took it off the market because they felt they couldn't make enough money. There were so few patients with the disease. And so when, when Abby first went to Washington, she met a congressman, Henry Waxman, a very well-known congressman from Southern California, one of the leading health policy uh, leaders in the 20th century, late 20th century. And he had a constituent with a very similar problem in his district. So they held hearings, but nobody came to the hearings and nobody cared. And the pharma industry was opposed to it. And by chance, a small uh, article on the hearings was printed in the LA Times. And it came to the attention of a then well-known actor. Again, many of your older listeners will know Jack Klugman, uh, who was in a television show called Quincy M.E., Medical Examiner. And he had a brother with a rare disease. And they saw the article and they were outraged. And they produced two episodes of their show focused on this problem and on the lack of progress on the bill. And Congress was flooded with letters, 50,000 letters, flooded Capitol Hill. Jack Klugman came and testified on Capitol Hill. It was on the front page of the New York Times. And that was what led to the passage of the act. And then just to finish that story, you know, another miracle, Ronald Reagan, who was a very conservative president who didn't believe in this kind of government intervention, announced that he was going to veto the bill. Uh, he announced he was going to veto the bill just before he went on Christmas vacation in Palm Springs with his wife, Nancy. And parents and advocates for the bill, family members, heard about that. And they reached out to their friends and other mothers in Palm Springs who knew Nancy and who socialized with her and read the same newspapers and went to the same clubs. And, and they persuaded her that this would be an outrage to not provide this kind of these help these drugs for these children get get developed. And so although he announced he was going to veto it the day before he left for vacation, the day he came back from vacation, Reagan signed the bill into law. So it overcame had to overcome a lot of obstacles to get, you know, to get that support. Is there something to the idea that there's a different group that is more interested in these rare drugs and diseases than the larger scale ones? Is there like a personality quality or a company based quality that directs in that direction? Well, there's a, there's a big, there's a thriving today, a rare disease community. You know, patients, families, when, you know, when, when parents learn that a child has been diagnosed with a rare genetic disease, typically, you know, very devastating diseases, often leading to a lifetime of disability, severe, often severe disability, often, of course, early death. Uh, the first thing they do typically is they look for, you know, some kind of other, other parents, right? Kind of a support group, a patient organization. And 40 right. years ago, all those organizations could do was try to comfort people and tell them to prepare, you know, for their child to suffer a tragic, you know, life and early death. Today, those same organizations are, they know that much can be done to treat these diseases. They're very activated. They support research. They raise money through all of the things we know about, the, the bake sales and the golf tournaments and the walkathons. And that money goes to support research. And so parents are now able to organize into these communities and actually help develop the therapies that can that can change the lives of their children and children who come along afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's a nice impact. I thought about that too in the book that there's communities for every single rare drug, whereas let's say 40 years ago you were by yourself. Exactly but right. Now there's like 
14 people in a forum or such and we have this too or we have a more extreme case you thought you were the extreme case but we are actually even more makes them feel better well then but it makes them feel better in a way but also helps them and help the scientists and the physicians who are studying the disease learn about those differences and understanding those differences is often what leads to finding an insight into how to treat them i translate it to even the content space anything that's more niche is less reaching out but also is more impactful and you can feel it is the same in this category something that treats everybody is okay and but it's not going to have that large impact of like oh i have this actual uh, i need a vasopressin receptor solution and then somebody else is like we have that and then you feel like without us bonding together this would never have happened right there's a saying in medicine treasure your exceptions and um, you know one way that that principle is applied is being applied today is there are many diseases that are very common, very widespread, that are not monogenic, that are not just one gene defect, uh, but that we're learning about through studying rare genetic subtypes. Take, for example, Alzheimer's disease, one of the most prevalent, most severe diseases, you know, afflicting older Americans, older people around the world today. And uh, what we're increasingly learning is many people have, have know of someone who has uh, suffered what is often called early onset Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, which strikes people in their as early as their 40s, for example. And when scientists and physicians study those patients, they find that they have particular genetic versions, genetic subtypes that are more, more severe. And we're learning today how to treat those severe genetic subtypes. And in learning that, you know, that's opening doors to treatments for the broader population as well. That's cool. I like that. Treasure your exceptions. That's a great message for anybody yeah. who's listening because it's valuable in that category, but also for uh, yourself being, it sets you apart in a way. Exactly. Maybe I'll bring that back up later as far as personality. But uh, on, in terms of companies, I want to mention this, that you mentioned a few companies, Genentech, Amgen, Biogen. I once for like a day did a high pressure liquid chromatography uh, training at yep. Amgen for a day. It was entertaining. And can you tell us about these companies, the conflicts they have had along the way, and any large winners in the space that come to mind over time? Yeah, no, you've mentioned some of the great early companies in, in biotechnology. And the reason they were so important, I would say two reasons. Number one, you know, traditional pharmaceutical companies whose roots go back, you know, two or three hundred years, were all based on chemistry, small molecules, medicinal chemistry that could be synthesized in a laboratory. And those, obviously, a lot of effective drugs were developed that way. But for these complex genetic diseases, the solutions are typically more biological products, proteins and genes. And those can't be synthesized chemically. They have to be produced from natural living sources. And so that revolution was really started by Watson and Crick in 1953, the development of the discovery of the double helix and the, the, you know, the, the genetic code, the DNA code. And that then led to, you know, you mentioned Genentech really the first biotechnology company which learned how to do, which was based on discoveries in how to do what's called genetic engineering, how to use the genetic code to produce, you know, so-called recombinant products, new proteins that are the same as the proteins that occur in our body, but that are grown in a, in a cell culture, grown in living cells. So Genentech, Amgen, Biogen, they were among the first generation of biotechnology companies, and they opened that door. But then I mentioned Genzyme earlier, and the reason Genzyme was a real pioneer is those companies in the early 1980s, the early years of the biotech revolution, they thought of themselves as kind of like science boutiques. They had, you know, world-class scientists on their, on their boards, Nobel laureates, and they thought that what they did and what they did do was they tried to discover drugs, tried to prove that a drug could work, and then license it to a big pharmaceutical company to market it. Genzyme had the model that for these rare diseases, you couldn't do that. The pharma companies wouldn't be interested, and the markets were so small that the company that developed the drug had to bring it to patients itself around the world. So Genzyme fundamentally changed the economic model of biotechnology from being a science boutique and kind of an out-licensing mentality to being a fully integrated company that would serve patients around the world. And that really was the spark that lit the orphan drug revolution in biotechnology in particular. It's a big deal for almost any category when you start to bring all the pieces in-house. You're way more efficient than if you have to always depend on this part of the supply chain or that person, that company. Exactly. You're, you're always at their whims in a way. Exactly. It's like the individual, they come on uh, Shark Tank and they're like, 
I had a, I now have my own factory running twenty four seven the way I mapped it out. So now I'm able to <laughs> do it big. It's kind of cool. Now, I was wondering this: what's the biggest hurdle to successful drug development? Uh, where we stand right now, November twenty twenty two. Well, the biggest hurdle, there are different kinds of hurdles. You know, there are uh, big scientific hurdles, and, you know, we're increasingly trying to understand complex genetic diseases. Some are simpler to understand. Some are much more complex. We're trying to develop novel, uh, you know, technologies, gene therapy, gene editing. You probably read about, you know, some of these discoveries. They're very complex. They're still in their early days, and as a result, many fail, and they're very expensive. Uh, but maybe, you know, that comment that they're very expensive, you know, we also face a big set of challenges around providing adequate reimbursement and returns to support investment in the field. And right now, as we speak, investment in orphan drugs and in biotechnology generally is at close to an all-time low because investors perceive that there are pressures to, you know, cap prices on Capitol Hill, that reimbursement mechanisms are not sufficient. And so in addition to addressing the scientific and medical challenges, we also need to address the reimbursement and pricing challenges that are necessary to support investment. Is there a way to push up or supplement the effort on orphan drug development? Or is it something where it's a small category, so it will be viewed as, as not worth the amount put in? No, there are ways to do it. And increasingly, you know, there are, as some of your listeners will know, there are 7,000 genetic diseases that have now been identified. Uh, Only a few hundred have therapies. The overwhelming majority have no therapy available. And many of those are so-called ultra-orphan diseases, even rarer, less than one-tenth as many as, you know, suffer from the orphan diseases that we talked about earlier. And so there are mechanisms. Uh. There are certain policies like priority review vouchers that can provide incentives for companies to successfully develop drugs. There are reimbursement reforms that can, that can provide adequate return for one-time therapies. And so, yes, though, and there's additional newborn screening to identify patients with these diseases at birth when they can be most effectively treated. So there are definitely things we can do as a society to try to ensure that when children are born with these diseases, they'll be identified, diagnosed, and there'll be a therapy available. Now, we are in the United States. If we look around the world, are there better places or worse places where when it comes to if you have an orphan disease, you would rather be there or you would not want to be there that come to mind? Yeah, there are in many different ways. Uh, I would say the orphan drug revolution, you know, and I talk about this in the book, has been a global revolution. I had the privilege of leading Genzyme's efforts in Europe for five years and then actually leading its international development in many countries around the world, from Latin America to Asia after that. And uh, what you see is that the, you know, ultimately over time in most of the developed world, Europe, Japan, you know, Australia, uh, virtually all patients who are diagnosed will receive therapy. Many of those countries, of course, have national health systems, and they actually are sometimes better at diagnosing patients early and getting them on therapy. So the penetration of these therapies into those populations is in many countries higher than it is in the United States. Sometimes there are pricing hurdles that need to be overcome, but uh, those you know can often be overcome. But obviously, in other countries, in you know what you might call developing countries or low and middle income countries, access is much more difficult. Uh, there are usually you know pilots, and most companies, Genzyme again tried to pioneer this, tried to find ways to provide access sometimes for free for a few patients to try to help societies understand what the disease was and how to develop the capabilities to treat it. But obviously, in, in poorer countries around the world, uh, access is still a major issue. And we, we have a long way to go to continue to develop you know, pilot programs and other ways to try to provide broader access. Is there any country-based conflict or is it a cooperative effort whereas we're doing research you're doing research let's work together or is it like we're doing research we're ahead a little bit so we're going to use this against you to profit in some way it's generally you know science is generally a very global collaborative enterprise obviously individual scientists understandably get competitive about you know their work and wanting to be the first and so on but generally it's a very collaborative community i would say one comment in answer to your question you know for listeners in the united states the United States 
has been the unquestioned leader in biotechnology for 40 years and, uh, and has you know, reaped the benefits of that in terms of economic development and in terms of what you might call uh, health diplomacy, the goodwill that that's generated around the world today. Uh, but there, there, are, there is a good biotechnology communities in Europe and Japan and other countries. But today, China is making a huge investment to, you know, to, to achieve global leadership. China has defined biotechnology as a strategic economic pillar. Uh, they're investing heavily in supporting companies and supporting research and attracting scientists and, and business leaders back from the United States and other countries. And, uh, you know, there are some positive aspects to that. But in the United States, if we don't continue to support research and if we don't continue to make, you know, reimbursement available, then I think there's a real chance that leadership in biotechnology will be lost to China in the years ahead. Hmm. Interesting. Would you say that as far as uh, momentum or activity, how would you describe right now, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago in the pharmaceutical space, as far as more interest, more activity or periods of stagnancy? There are there are periods of both. Um, you know, I, I talk in the book about the kind of the beginning of the end. Genzyme, which was a, a wonderful company, a privilege to work for, and I think it's fair to say widely admired, you know, throughout the world and throughout the industry. Uh, unfortunately, you know, suffered at one point a tragic uh, uh, event, which was a um, uh, kind of an infection. You know, as I said, these products are, are produced in living cells and cell culture reactors, very large cell culture reactors. And uh, one of Genzyme's cell culture reactors got infected. And as a result, the whole facility, the whole manufacturing plan had to be shut down. The product was out of stock. It was a crisis and a tragedy for patients, for the companies. And that, that led to Genzyme being acquired. And some people felt that that was kind of the end of the orphan drug revolution and, and, and a void developed in some ways. But then, you know, some others came along, as always happens. And I, the second half of the book opens with the story of a venture capital firm, also here in Boston, that I was also privileged to be associated with called Third Rock Ventures, and Third Rock's founders looked at this environment and they felt and they saw that pharma companies and other venture capitalists had become conservative and they'd become risk averse just as pharma had, you know, 20 years earlier. And so they reestablished a model of bold, high risk investing, uh, looking at transformational therapies, often in rare diseases with significant investments behind them. And some of those were very successful. That attracted a lot of investors, and that then, I think it's fair to say, helped turn around the model in the venture community so that today, orphan drugs have become among the most, uh, let's say, uh, widely uh, you know, invested uh, therapies in all of the biotechnology community. Is it sort of that in some companies that there's a base of the larger scale drugs, and then, okay, now that we have this solid investment and foundation here, we have the ability to take more risk in the smaller scale drug. There is that exactly. And I, I talk about that in the book. And I talk about the fact that uh, even the great orphan drug companies, Genzyme, and I mentioned others in there, of course, Biogen, Biomarin, Vertex, Alnylam, and others, uh, that none of them, that, let me put it in a positive way, that, that all of them leveraged and relied upon uh, some of these therapies for larger indications to survive. And often what they ended up doing was developing a therapy that worked for some kind of cardiovascular disease or cancer or, or some other prevalent disease, and then licensing that or, or selling that to a big pharma company. And the, the, the cash that they received, the funding that they received for selling off those assets were what allowed them to survive and to develop the therapies for rare diseases internally. So yes, and I think, and pharma companies today, exactly as you said, almost any company needs to have a base of you know, operations in larger diseases to off which you leverage the investment and the and the uh, and the supply of these rarer diseases. Is there more because we're now in a social expression landscape? Is there more showcasing of the results of orphan drugs publicly because there's something more palpable about it about rescuing? It's almost like rescuing a smaller group versus taking care of many, is that done more through videos or articles or ways to showcase, hey, look what we have done? Yeah, social media has had a huge impact. Obviously, parents, families are always communicating, and it's so much easier. You know, with these rare diseases, there may not be another family in your immediate, you know, neighborhood. That There are others around the country and around the world. 
who are much more you're much more able to be in touch with, obviously, through social media. Another example of what you're saying, uh, which I think is a very visible example, is there was a, a, a small group of patients and families, you know, many years ago, early in these orphan drug revolution years, started a, a day to observe these that they called Rare Disease Day. And as a, as a kind of a slightly uh, humorous, uh, but also because there weren't so many of them, you know, gesture to that, Rare Disease Day was on February 29th because that only came once every four years. It was a rare day. And, uh, and it started with a very small number of people and families in the United States and Europe. Today, it has grown into an event that is observed in more than 100 countries around the world with thousands of events every year on, now it's called the last day of February. So it's either February 28th or 29th. So it occurs every year. And millions of people take part across all of these different hundreds of patient organizations in different countries uh, to rally, to create awareness, to lobby with their governments for access and for research. And that's a highly visible day that brings a lot of attention in, in almost every state in the United States and almost every country around the world to this to this situation. It's a nice thing. I see the progression. It's almost like treasure in the rare, and then it becomes less rare, and it's like bringing value to the rest of humanity from that base of... All things have to come from the difficult, the rare, the specific, and then they branch out. Yep. And everybody's able to use that. I think that's very well said. And again, you, you know, there are there are individual patients I talk about in the in the book. And to give you an example of exactly what you said, actually, there are many. But one example, which was very central to the founding and the success of Genzyme, was the first therapy that Genzyme worked on developing a therapy for was called Gaucher disease. That's spelled like G A U C H E R, like Goucher, but it's named after a French physician named Gaucher. And, um, and it was being studied by a physician at the National Institutes of Health in Roscoe Brady. And he had spent many years studying it, and he had identified what the defect was. It was one enzyme that was defective. And he reasoned that if you could replace that enzyme uh, with a proper enzyme, then you could treat the disease. But it was very hard to find that enzyme. He had to, the only place you could find it was in human placentas, and he had to process thousands of placentas to get these tiny trace elements of this protein. And then he got some, and he started a clinical trial. This was after you know 20 years of research. And he did a clinical trial with seven patients, and six of them were adults. And at th in those years, you know, FDA guidelines said you couldn't enroll children in a trial until it had been shown to be safe and work in adults. But one mother whose child had, had Gaucher disease as a three-year-old child insisted that Roscoe Brady enroll her child. She quit her job. She went to work at the NIH. She was in his lab every day until finally he managed to somehow, you know, kind of bend the rules to enroll this child. His name was Brian Berman, three-year-old boy. And when the results of the trial came out, in the six patients that Roscoe had originally enrolled, the drug didn't work in any of them, not at all. But in Brian, it worked beautifully. And you could tell because one of the symptoms is a so-called distended belly. It looks like you have a basketball in your stomach. And you could see that in this one boy, his stomach would expand. And then when they got the enzyme, it would contract and it would expand and contract. And so some people said, well, the trial failed. You know, one patient, what's one patient? But, but Dr. Brady and Henry Tamir, they said, no, what this showed us was the dose was too low. These adults were much larger. And, you know, they were studying, learning many things about the disease. He found out what the enzyme was, but he didn't know how much the patients needed. And it turned out he underestimated dramatically and so when he gave it to the child, it worked. And so then they did another trial with 12 adults, taking the dose up to the appropriate level for adults, and it worked in all 12 adults. And from there, it went on to become the standard of care around the world. There's a great message in that one because it's like, no, I want to try this, and we're going to make it happen. Someone needs to push for something to occur in special cases before the great things can happen. It always has to be some sort of extra item or more than usual or something different. That's the only way. And it, it takes passion. It takes people who believe, who have this sense of mission. They see these children, these patients with this need. They see these scientists and physicians, and they say, hey, we've got to do everything we can to, 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 to bring these together. And the, the story of the book is actually a story of how, for many of these great companies, all the companies we mentioned before and many companies that are active today, uh, they, they tried to treat a disease, to develop a therapy, and it failed. And it failed again. And they had to decide, were they going to give up? And they believed that they were they had a mission that they were committed to achieving. And so they studied why did it fail and how can we find another way to do it? And they finally found a way to succeed, often 
you know, five and 10 and 15 years later, but they kept at it until they did. It's such a good message for failure is part of it and not to deny failure. Okay. This didn't work. There's a failure. There's something missing. We don't have all the pieces errors were made or whatever. And now we're going to work towards it again, not discarding the effort. That's just the process. If you give up or if you don't call it a failure and say, no, it was partially a success, even when it wasn't, then your productivity disappears and you won't get somewhere worthwhile. You have to be optimistic, but you absolutely have to be realistic. Realistic optimism together. This is one thing I want to include here. This I, I like to point out the elements of books when I notice certain details. And one thing I very much liked about your book was the notes section. Very nice looking, the nicest no looking note section <laughs> I've seen in a book with tabs and portions for the parts because uh, these days when I read a book first, I go to the notes section, see if I recognize any people or authors because now I've read a lot of books. And so it's a nicer way for me to like preface getting into the book because, oh, that person, I recognize this or that topic. And so I thought it looked great the that's way you good. did. Well, that's nice to hear. I should say that credit for that uh, really goes to the publisher. And the publisher, as you'll see there, is uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. And Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories might not be, you know, too well known to your listeners. It's on Long Island. It's the home laboratory of uh, James Watson, the Nobel laureate, the discoverer of DNA, who's still there, you know, 60 years later. Um, and it also has among the largest group of Nobel laureates in physiology and medicine of any institution in the world. So it's a very high quality academic publisher and very well known in the scientific space. And I was very honored that they chose to publish this book. I think they did a great job on that part. One thing that comes to mind is, uh, who are some people in this field that you work with now or that you think highly of currently? Is there any people that come to mind that you would showcase uh, for the research or they're writing about it that come to mind? Well, there are a number. I mean, certainly, I mean, uh, it's almost hard to know where to start. You know, I mean, I would, I would have to start one name that would come to mind would be, uh, you know, Phil Sharp. Uh, who was a founder of Biogen uh, in the early 1980s, 40 plus years ago, a Nobel laureate, and um, who has remained on the Biogen board to this day and has been a, you know, a leader in developing Biogen as a great leader in, in neuroscience and therapies for musculosclerosis and other diseases and been a mentor to many, including me, in this community. Um, Question on that one. What did it take for him to be a great leader? Uh, what did it take for him to be a great leader? Um, you know, for, <laughs> uh, well, first of all, he's brilliant. That helps. <laughs> but, but beyond that, you know, he's, he's humble. And what makes a great leader, I think, is he gives of his time. You know, he, he, he has a cause that he wants to help advance, but he also takes the time to bring people along, to listen to people, to enlist other people, you know, in that cause in a way that, like Henry Tamir did, makes people want to join him and, and work with him to help these things succeed. And that, you know, there are many people today who are much younger, who are starting out in their careers. I, in the last section of the book, I give case studies of four or five companies that are active today, that are struggling today, that are still in that cycle of, you know, they tried something and it failed and they're recovering and, you know, and I'm optimistic they're all going to succeed, but, but they have great leaders today, great leaders as entrepreneurs, great leaders as scientists, all trying to figure out how do they ultimately overcome these problems and, and get these therapies to work. I brought that up because it comes to mind that if you have an organization and you don't have great uh, leadership and structure, whether you have great knowledgeable people or not, somehow they won't be directed in the right form and then things won't get moving. Yeah. No, it's a leadership. Yeah. I mean, leadership is an incredibly important quality here and people who can organize you know, one of the things that drew me in to biotechnology, to this rare disease community, I was a consultant uh, working in many different industries. And of course, you know, they were all trying to make money, which was you know, a respectable thing to do. But what I found when I started working in this field is the, the great companies have to attract great scientists and physicians to be part of their team. And those individuals, they understand that companies have to make money and have to provide a return to their shareholders. But, but they will only stay if they believe the company really honors the science and puts patients first. And so the culture of leadership that is required and that you find in these companies is, I found, at a different level. And it's at a level that has a kind of a, you know, an inspirational quality to it, as well as a quality of effective management.
I have two questions and one comes to mind or two last questions and one comes to mind from what you just said. You're a consultant. As a consultant, do you usually come in with a goal of what you would want to do or how you would want to help? Or do you come in looking to see what the issue is and then responding to maybe what they're asking of you? Which direction is it? Well, as a consultant, I think, you know, I think what I, the way I approach it, the way I think most people do is you try to understand what was your client trying to achieve, the problem they were trying to solve or the thing they were trying to advance. And I, I felt I was very proud of what I did, but, but ultimately, you know, a little bit, as you said earlier, when talking about, you know, being dependent on others, ultimately, if you're a consultant, obviously you, you know, you give kind of advice, but then it's up to other people who are building businesses you know, whether they will take it or not. And ultimately, I found that it was more rewarding to, you know, be in the company and be making the decisions and be part of building the company, as opposed to just giving the advice and hoping that, you know, hoping that somebody followed it. That makes sense. I get that concept. Yeah, because at some point, wait a minute, not everything I'm saying is going, I'd rather be closer to the direction or what's happening. Right. That's true. My last question will be, as far as your book, Inside the Orphan Drug Revolution, what is a message you would want people to take away about patient-centered biotechnology today? Well, I, I wrote the book really for two reasons. I think one was that there were many people, that some of whom we've talked about, that I felt privileged to work with, that I think are heroes, who've done amazing work, who deserve to be celebrated, whose stories deserve to be known by a wider public. And I hope people will enjoy those and find them inspiring as they inspired me, particularly maybe younger entrepreneurs and scientists. Uh, the second is that... Um, you know, like most great things, we can't take this revolution for granted. And I talk in the book about the greatest risk to these therapies continuing to be developed and available is complacency. And if the public, you know, starts to think, well, okay, sure, we, we get all those drugs, but, but if they start to fall for some of these false, you know, demagogues talking about things like, you know, capping prices, and if they don't understand that what matters to patients and families are the policies of their insurance provisions uh, and what the insurance companies cause, you know, charge them as opposed to what the drug companies charge the insurance companies, uh, then the revolution will come to a halt and investment will go away. And, uh, and that's, you know, we're, that's the risk of happening today. And for those, you know, 7,000 diseases that remain untreated and the parents and the grandparents who are going to have children born with these diseases, if we want these therapies to continue to flourish, people need to understand they should become informed about the issues and they should speak up for the policies that will allow those to continue to thrive. That makes sense. When you speak up on things, you give them an energy so they can move forward. Right. James, I would like to thank you for having joined on this episode and described a bit from your book and sharing some knowledge with all of us. Thank you, Armin. There were great questions, and it's been a pleasure talking with you. Same to you. And we are out.